Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Focused. Skilled. Fearless. Is it too late for our world? Or can we still change? What, 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 if, what if Christians stood up and publicly declared our faith in Jesus? What if Las Vegas itself, what if Las Vegas experienced an uprising of unashamed men and women who boldly claimed Christ, who graciously demonstrated love, who intelligently shared the gospel? The Uprising is a two-week sermon series that will challenge your walk with God, that will challenge you to stand up, walk across the room, open your mouth, and talk about Jesus. And I believe one by one, we as a church will see people experience God, receive forgiveness, join the cause, and soon they too will be among those that are in the Uprising. Today's first sermon of only two is entitled Defiant, Refusing to Conform. Why that subtitle, Pastor, for the first sermon? Here's why. Because the definition of defiant is to refuse to conform. <laughs> you know what I love about, the, um, about my Americanness? There's something deep inside me that refuses to conform. There's something deep inside of me that goes back to 1774 and 1776 that says, no, when the rest of the world says, as sheep, whatever you say. Do you know what Christians are to be? And this may surprise some of you who grew up in religious homes. Christians are to be defiant defiant against the, the, the prince and the power of this world, defiant against the world's system that stereotypes everyone and classifies everyone and pushes everyone into a box, defiant against our own flesh that wants to destroy us and push us the wrong direction. The fact is we as Christians are to be defiant and unwilling, refusing to conform to the rest of the world. And that's what Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 12, and verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world as sheep walking to the slaughter where there is no true shepherd. Friend, I will tell you this, that we as Christians ought to stand up, rise up with such a heart of defiance. Now, before you get nervous, and I've had people tell me they were nervous about this sermon series, we weren't sure what I was going to say or what we were going to do. I'll state this about defiance. This is the proposition for sermon number one. The defiant Christian is absolutely unwilling to conform to this world. What does that mean? It means that we're filled with the Spirit, and being filled with the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Let me explain. For those of you who watched your friends get baptized, for those of you who are new to this whole Christian concept, let me explain what I mean by that. It means in a world of hate, we will not conform and we will be loving. In a world of sadness, we will not conform, we will show joy. In a world filled with turmoil, we will not give in to anxiety. We will have peace. In a world that is filled with impatience, we are the ones who choose to show patience. In a world that is not self-controlled, we are the ones who decide to have temperance. You see, we are the antithesis of what the rest of the world is because Jesus, our Savior, is the antithesis of what the rest of the world is. 
The problem that we face today is that we as Christians have given in to the pressure of the world and we've said, we'll do and be whatever they are and where people are angry, we show anger back and where people are hateful, we show hateful hateness back and where people show anxiety, we filled with anxiety ourselves and it's time for us to stand up and be different from the rest of the world in these ways. Can I get an amen? amen. What do I do to be defiant, pastor? What do I do? I'll tell you this, number one. A defiant Christian, number one, will demonstrate allegiance. Okay, I'll be defiant, pastor. I don't want to be like the rest of the world. Then how do I do that? Here it is. As a Christian, a defiant Christian will, number one, demonstrate their allegiance. A moment ago, that's exactly what we saw in the baptisms. When you demonstrate allegiance, you remember as a child in school, you would stand in school and they would raise the flag and everybody put their hand over their heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag. And that's great. I'm an American, man. I love this country. But I'll tell you, more than an American, I'm a Christian. And I don't simply want to demonstrate my, my, my loyalty to a temporary empire or a temporary republic or a temporary democracy. I want to pledge my loyalty more than that to the kingdom that never ends, to the royal king that never, never gets off the throne. And we must demonstrate our loyalty, demonstrate our allegiance. How do we do that? A moment ago, we saw baptism. Baptism is a great example of demonstrating your allegiance. It's to say, I stand with Jesus. Look, l- l- let, me, let, me, uh, let me let you know how much I understand. I get that you live in a world and you work in a workplace and you go to a school where the majority of people, look, look, you're not being judgmental, it's just facts. They don't stand with Jesus. But you are to be the one who does. You're to be this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. When you see somebody get baptized, that's what they're doing. This is what Romans chapter six tells us baptism is really all about. It's about identification with Jesus Christ. It says we are buried with Christ, buried with Jesus by baptism into his death. And that like as Christ was raised up from the dead of the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. You know, one day the Bible says Jesus was walking by the Jordan River. And John the Baptist was out there baptizing people. And John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which will take away the sins of the world. And Jesus walked forward to be baptized. And John said, I can't baptize you. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, Baptize me. And the Bible says, John the Baptist took him down into the water. And Jesus himself was buried under the water and pulled up out of the water. Why was Jesus doing that? He was signifying his death, that through his death, he would be resurrected and that we ourselves, if we are with Christ and believe on Christ, we call upon Christ and our old life dies and our new life begins. That's what baptism is. So that's why it's beautiful to see these folks do this. My daughter Scarlett is eight years old, going on 20. (laughs) For those who know her know it's true. Scarlett is, is going to be baptized at the next service. So proud of her. Some, for some, eight years old might seem very young. For others, that might seem, wow, you waited a long time. We believe that a child should be old enough to understand baptism before they are baptized. Instead of subjugating my children to a faith that is not their own, through forced infant baptism, we've made the decision to wait and train them in the word of God, raise them in church, and have them come to their own faith. And when they understand who Jesus is, that God does love them, and that God loved them so much that Jesus came to die upon the cross, because each of us are own sinners, and that he was buried and rose from the grave, when a child fully understands that and believes on Christ, calls upon Christ, and they're saved, then they're old enough to understand what baptism is all about. So my daughter Scarlett, for the last two years, she's been saying, can I get baptized? Can I get baptized? And we look at her and say, no. (laughs) Now that might seem strange to you. You say, why would you tell your child no? Because we wanted to make sure she fully understood the decision she's making. 
So for two years, every month or so, she'd come up and she would have her, have her little Bible or something, and she'd be with her little paperwork from Sunday school, and she would say, so I've been thinking about getting baptized. <laughs> Not yet, sweetie. I'd get those little connection cards, and on it would say scarlet, all scribbled on, and on the back, decision to get baptized, little notes, hey, dad, read this, you know. <laughs> I'd be going through all the connection cards, and I'd just put that one aside. <laughs> I want to make sure she understood. This last week, we were discussing it. Actually, the last few months, we were discussing baptism. And, and I said to her, I said, sweetie, why do you want to get baptized? It's always my first question to anybody. Why do you want to? There's a lot of wrong motivations to get baptized. She had the right one. She said this. She said, because I believed in Jesus, and I want to show everybody. That's it. Let me ask you a question, Christian. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Say it. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Okay. Do you want to show people or no? Amen. See, one of the reasons we choose to get baptized is because we're at the point where we're so thankful for all he's done for us. We just want to tell everyone. Baptism is a demonstration of allegiance. You know another demonstration of allegiance? I'll give it to you. Church attendance. Amen. Can I get an amen from church attenders? Amen. How many of you are like, ooh, I made it, I'm here, so I'm okay. <laughs> it's true. Church attendance is a dedication. It's a statement of our faith. Let me explain it this way. How many of you like coming to church because it's good for you? How many of you like it? Say amen. amen. If you don't, I don't know why you're here, right? Okay. You like coming to church because it's good. How many of you love your pastor? Amen. Say amen. amen. You better. You better. I mean, I need the validation. <laughs> Sure, we love coming to church. This is what Hebrews chapter 10 says. Uh, it talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but we need to consider one another, to provoke one another, to love and to good works. It's what happens when we get together as Christians. We get together and we consider one another, we think about one another, we help one another. This is what we do. And don't forsake coming together. But let me propose to you this. Let me propose to you this. How many of you like coming to church because of what it does for you? Say amen. Yeah. Okay, can I propose to you that that's not the only reason you should come to church? Now, Americans have a very difficult time with this because we are a marketed, advertised society. We as Americans often do what we do primarily out of what we can get out of it. We don't often, in our culture, have a sense of duty. We do it because it's the right thing to do. Now, I'll tell you, if you come to church only because it's your duty, you do need to have a heart issue d dealing with. I, I would say that, absolutely. You want to do it because it's so awesome and God teaches you and you run. But coming to church simply because of what it does for you is not enough reason to come to church. Sometimes we come to church because it is the right thing to do. Because we're committed to it. Because we're defiant against the rest of the world system. Because we stand up and say, because even though in this moment I may not feel like I need to go to church, I come to church because it is the right thing to do. I love our church members for this. There's this sweet young couple that's been coming. They're probably 21 or 20 years old. They're very, very young, very sweet. They'll be here at the next service. And I got a text message from them. They had to travel out of town. Last Sunday, I got a text message from them. This is what they said. They said, really happy that you guys have Facebook Live. He said, Nydia and I have had a chance to watch the service as we drive home from Phoenix. You know what that is? That is an absolute dedication that even if I'm on the freeway, I'm still going to church. Amen? Amen. 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 This is not normal in our society. That's why we need to refuse to conform. I'll tell you what's normal in our society. Everything other than church. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you showed up. How many of you like music? How many of you, you're a music person? I mean, you're like, you've got music playing all the time. How many of you like that? How many of you like, you got some music playing? Did you know that the average American, according to, um, according to billboard.com, the average American spends 120 hours per month listening to audio? 120 hours per month. How many of you like it? But by the way, I love it too, man. I'm, I, it's always on in my car. I'm so sick of talk radio and everything else, man. I like to get some music going. How many of you like that? Say amen. 120 hours. How many of you think, man, I didn't know it was that much, but it is. How many of you love, how many, come on, honestly, how many of you like a little television now and then, a little television now and then, like every couple, 
you know, hours. How many of you like a little television? <laughs> How many got the Netflix? Yeah, yeah. The other day I called the Facebook. I called Facebook the Facebook. And my, my wife said, okay, Grandpa, <laughs> the Facebook. <laughs> you have Netflix, you know, you've got Apple TV, you got cable, whatever it might be. I have, absolutely. How many of you got a favorite television show? How many of you seen Designated Survivor? Come on. Amen. All right, there it is. All right. Giving, showing my cards here. All right. Let me, let me tell you this. The average American, though we love television, is fine, spends 150 hours per month watching television, according to statisticbrain.com. 150 hours. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the music. I'm not even saying there's anything wrong with television. I'm just giving you a comparative here. How many of you like going to the gym? Not as many. <laughs> How many of you gym, gym rats out there? Come on, let me see. All right, some of you gym rats out here. All right, very good. Like going to the gym? Raise your hand. I'm a rat. Yay. All right. A lot of people go to the gym, America, in, fact, in, our, in our city, we're actually a very, very health conscious city. A lot of people are making sure they're taking care of the health. According to uh, statisticsbrain.com, again, did you know that the average gym member goes to the gym 12 to 15 days every month? Now, you might think, that's not a lot. No, that's three, four days every single week they're at the gym. Think about that, three to four days every single week. Now, keep that in mind, and let me give you another statistic. Did you know, according to the recent Pew Research, only 40% of Americans say they attend church at all, and of those 40%, of everyone that goes, Christians only go to church 1.7 times per month. <coughs> now, I'm not be look, I'm not in any way being judgmental. I'm trying to tell you what our society is. So wait a second, Pastor. I thought you said a gym member goes to the gym 12 to 15 times per month and a church member goes to church 1.7 times per month. Yeah. That means gym members are 900% more committed to their gym than Christians are to their church. Look, I'm just sharing the information, folks, and I'm trying to say it's time for an uprising. Do we wonder why our society is the way it is? Look, go to the gym. You need to take care of your body. But what about our society who is falling apart and going to hell because Christians can't get up and go to church? Can I get an amen? amen. See, so what we're saying is it's time to stand up. It's time to demonstrate our allegiance through baptism, through church attendance, through being dedicated, even though it's not always easy to be dedicated. I got to tell you about Chris. My brother Chris, he's coming to the next service. Chris is a great guy. Chris, Chris is that big, um, big dude, Chris Hood. He's a big dude that I bring up for illustrations sometime to prove how big other people are and how tiny I am. <laughs> I love Chris, man. I talked to him this week. Let me tell you about Chris. That dude is a dedicated dude, not only to the gym because he's a gym member, but to the church because he's a church member. I said, tell me about your schedule, J Chris. He said, Pastor, I go to work on Saturday night at 8.30. And I get off at 6.30. First thing he said was, Pastor, you know my schedule. You I know I said, I just want to make sure I know because I'm going to talk about it. He said, okay, you know, I get off at 6.30 in the morning on Sunday morning. I said, yeah. Every week, every week, every week, every week. 6.30 in the morning, Sunday morning he gets off. He said, it takes me an hour to get home. I arrive at 7.30. I get a nap for one hour. Then get, I get up and get ready, and I drive across town, pick up my son Christian. And he said, then I head over to church. And I asked him a question I already knew the answer to. I said, is it easy? The word he used was resistance. He said, it's worth it, Pastor, it's worth it. I said, I know it's worth it. I'm saying, is it easy? He said, well, he said I love it, I love it. I said, but is it easy? He said, no. He said this, there is always resistance. He said, I'm tired. You know we have a new baby. <laughs> And, and sometimes I think God will understand, and how many of you are thankful that God understands? Amen. And he thinks to himself on Sunday morning, God will understand if I skip again, and it's not a big deal. I said, then why do you come? Here's what he said. This is what he said. He said, because it's important to me that I'm in church and my children see me in church. So whatever it takes, I make it a priority. That's what he said. You know what I love about pastoring this church? 
that story is not unique. It's so many of you. And I know what it's like if I pastored in Kentucky and everybody worked eight to five on Monday and people come to church on Sunday, that's easy. But your dedication to say, regardless of what it is, I'm not gonna be the typical Christian who shows up to church 12 times a year. I'm gonna be the Christian that is demonstrating his love for God, defiant, not refusing to conform to this world, rising up, spreading the word, changing the world. Why? Because we demonstrate allegiance, but number two, we expect resistance. Coming from the story we just heard, we expect, if we are defiant, standing with Christ, rising up, we expect to be resisted. Walking with Christ has never been an easy thing. Yes, we're part of the royal family, and yes, we get what we need from the king of kings, but here's the reality, the king has enemies. And this is why we ended, I'd say that this sermon series is really the sequel of royalty, and here's why. Last week we ended in Romans chapter eight, And I want to pick up there right now. Look at Romans chapter 8 on the screen in verse 37 through 39. You remember this passage. It says, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. How many of you are thankful you're a conqueror today? Say amen. Amen. One more time. How many are thankful you're a conqueror? Say amen. amen. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature can separate me from the love of Christ. How many of you are thankful that nothing will separate you from God's love getting to you? Can you get an amen? Amen. So that's what we learned last week. But can I tell you, the Bible also says that we love him because he first loved us. Now the Bible tells us that nothing can keep his love from getting to us. My question is, what is it that's keeping your love from getting to him? Everything is gonna fight your love getting to him. His love will never fail. Sometimes ours does. It's because we're against resistance. Things are constantly getting in the way of our love relationship with God. Different things that are good, but they keep us from God. Can I share with you a few things that will resist you? Walk away. Look, I'm for every single man and woman in this room who says, I want to be a defiant Christian who rises up and walks with God. Let me share a few things that will keep you from that. Work. Don't get me wrong, Christian. You got to work. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. How many of you realize that so far? Can I get an amen? But can I tell you that work should not be such a priority that it keeps you from your relationship with God on a continual basis. What is it that you can do to rearrange the life God has given you and you're in control of so that you can draw closer to God? It's a question. Here's another thing that will fight you. Children, can I get an amen? (laughs) What do you mean by that, Pastor Josh? I'm saying these are things that will fight you in your love relationship with God. I have a love relationship with Heather. I love Heather, she loves me. And we have brought three enemies into our home. (laughs) They don't know, they don't know they're trying, they don't know what they're doing. I don't blame them. But how many times have they become the resistance that keeps us from loving each other? Uh, They don't know. They don't know any better. Can I tell you, children require a lot of attention. But if there's so much attention given to them that we give no attention to each other, our love relationship will fail. Children require a lot of attention. But if they require so much attention, they keep you from your love relationship with God, it's going to fail. Well, I gotta tell you, we are committed to our children and to their extracurricular activities and to ballet and to gymnastics and to baseball, but ain't none of that gonna get between me and my relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you another thing that will fight you, your lover. I am so in love with Heather and she with me, obviously. But we made a commitment years ago that we will not let the other keep us from our walk with Jesus. I'm telling you, resistance. Expect it from from hobbies, 
They'll keep you from God. Sports that try to keep you from God. Friends that try to keep you from God. Society as a whole that try to keep you. Setbacks. You go through a setback instead of looking at it as a setup for future opportunity. You say, oh man, what is God doing? And that allows you to keep you from God. And what I'm trying to say is you need to make the decision right now. If I need to be baptized, I'm going to do it. Nothing's going to keep me from it. If I need to be in church, I'm going to do it. Nothing's going to keep me from it. If I need to be in the word of God, nothing's going to keep me from it. If I need to be in prayer, nothing's going to keep me from it. Why? Because it's time for an uprising of Christians who are going to stand and declare, I stand with the Lord. I'm defiant against the rest of the world. I will not be conformed like all the other sheep. Can I get an amen? amen. What should we do as Christians? Here it is. Number three, the defiant Christian will demonstrate allegiance, expect resistance. And number three, a defiant Christian will recruit the absent. See, if we're really part of an uprising, part of an uprising is finding out those who are not part of the uprising and recruiting them. Look around you. Look around you. Do you see any empty seats? I know what you think. You come in and you're like, man, this place is full. It ain't full. It is from your perspective, but from the pastor's perspective, I see a seat, I see a seat, I see a seat. <laughs> Say, but that won't be comfortable with more people. Hey, we'll start more services, I promise you. I will do 12 a day, can I get an amen? I will do it, I will swear, I'll do it, man. Jason and Kimberly, like, oh Lord, no. <laughs> Choir's like, God help us. <laughs> the Bible tells us about a man named Andrew. Andrew one day met Jesus. His whole life he'd been told about Messiah coming. His whole life he'd been told, Messiah's gonna come, Messiah's gonna come. Andrew was introduced at a riverbank one day to a guy named Jesus when John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God. Andrew turns around and says, the Lamb of God? He goes and talks to Jesus, spends time with Jesus, and the Bible says he walks away thinking of one person is in his mind, one person. He's thinking, my brother Peter. My brother Peter needs to know about Jesus. And he goes home and he says to Peter this, Andrew findeth his own brother Simon, Peter, and saith unto him, I have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. A defiant Christian recognizes the absent person, finds them and brings them to Jesus. So my question is, who's your Peter? Who, Andrew, is the Peter God is calling you to bring? You know, we're coming up to Easter in two weeks. It is the best moment all year to invite somebody to church. It's very easy. Hey, what are you doing on Easter? They know it's coming. You're a Christian, you know. <laughs> and if they don't know you're a Christian, they're about to. Can I get an amen right there? Because we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We're part of the uprising. We got Easter coming up. Would you like to go with me? Who's your Peter friend? This is what I want you to do. In the seat in front of you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pull out these two cards. Do you see them? Pull them out. One says Easter, the other says the uprising. They go together more than you would realize, and I'm about to explain why. The band is coming forward. Don't mind them as they get ready. Look at the card. Put the Easter card off to the side, and I want you right now to look at the uprising card. Look at it. This is what I want you to do. We're going to play a game over the next couple weeks, a spiritual game that has big impact. It's called 531. Andrew, listen now. I want you to identify five people in your life that you can invite to Easter by way of social media. Very easy. Send them a Facebook message. If they respond poorly, say, it wasn't me. I got hacked. <laughs> Who are the five people that God, I believe this right now because I've been praying all week and I'm going to pray it now, that the Holy Spirit of God, by His power, would speak to your heart and tell you who your Peter is. Are there five? Five, three, one, three. Three people that you will personally phone call. You remember what that was? A text message. One of the two. Hey, what are you doing on Easter? Why? 
I want you to come to church with me and I'll take you to lunch, let you pay. Because <laughs> you're a Christian. You know. 531. And then I want you to put the one name that comes to your mind above every other name. Go ahead and pull it out. Every single person, pull it out. Who's the one person that you will personally, eyeball to eyeball, invite to Easter with this card? That you can give them and you say, look, I don't know how to say it, but this is the fact. I'm a Christian and I love my church and my pastor's awesome. Amen. Amen. And I want you to come on Easter. That's all. Give it to them. And then ask them, will you please come with me? We have a church member named Craig G. Craig was at work, and everybody at work knows he's a Christian. And he had a guy named Wade who's been working with him for a while now, and Wade's been going through a lot. And Wade said something to the effect of, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this. And Craig decided to open his mouth and he said, hey, would you like to come to church with me? You get nervous. Wade started coming to church. I went out with coffee with him this last week and Wade told me, he said, the moment I walked into this church, I had not been in church for over 20 years. I walked in and I said, this is my home. He said, man, I love your church. And this is what he said. I'm so thankful that Craig invited me. Who's your Wade? We have a church member. His name is Dean. Dean's right here. Dean sent me an email recently. It, said, it began by saying this. It began by saying, I'm deciding to amp it up in 2016. He said, last year I decided I'm going to amp it up in 2016. He said, so I made a list of 10 people that I want to know about Jesus. And at the very top of his list was his father. Greg? And he said, at the very top of his list, he put his father. He said, I want to know my father's saved. He said, Pastor, he told me this. He said, Pastor, I've been praying for him for 23 years to get saved, but 2016's got to be the year. He says, oh, God, I prayed for him, and I sent him Bible verses, and I posted on social media, and I sent him all sorts of stuff. This is literally what he said. And he said, in the middle of the year, he contacted me, and we went out in my truck, and he said, we parked in a parking lot, and for the next hour, I explained to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, after 23 years of praying in that truck bed, he said, my father bowed his head and received Jesus Christ as Savior. That was in the summer. A few months later, they drove all the way to Florida to see him baptized. Can I get an amen? My question is, who is your Wade? Who is your Peter? Who is your family member? We have a church member named Priscilla. They hold something at this church called Toastmasters. She had a friend coming. Her name was Liz. You saw her get baptized. The reason Liz got baptized is because she had a friend who was, well, who's your Liz? Christian, it's, we're, we're done waiting for others to bring about change. It's time for us to share Jesus who can bring the real change. We have church members named Thomas and Jill. How many of you know Thomas and Jill? Man, they are powerful Christians. Thomas and Jill recently invited a friend to live with them who was going through a difficult time. Jill is cool because she's very real. Jill said she was at home. She was not in a good mood at all. Not in a good mood. How many of you that does not surprise you about Jill? She was not in a good mood. <laughs> Thomas and their friend Travis were talking, 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 and she said, I just wanted to go get dinner. We're going to the Outback. And so she said, I want Outback. She said, all right. So they all three went to the Outback. 
all three of them are sitting there. There was no tables, so they had to sit in the bar area, and all three of them are sitting in this little stool in the bar area. And Travis, who is not a believer, began to talk about all, all that he wanted. He said, what I really need is a woman. He said, you guys need to help me find a woman. I need a woman, I need a woman, I need a woman, Travis kept saying. And Jill got sick of it. She looked up from her steak and her potatoes. She didn't even want to be there. She just wanted out back. And she said, what you really need is Jesus. That's what you need. And she said, she, she said I don't know what came over me. I'll tell you, it's the Holy Spirit. She said, she began to tell him. She said, Travis, the fact is, if all you ever do is start worshiping women or worshiping other things you might want, you'll miss out on the most important thing, and that is Jesus, and he loves you, and he died upon the cross to pay for your sins. He's buried and rose from the grave. He said, I, she said, I started sounding just like you, Pastor. She said, I was about to say, bow your head and close your eyes. Raise your hand. She said, I looked at him in the middle of my speech. I said, Travis, do you want to get saved? And he said, yeah, I do. And she said, I was shocked. She said, right there, we bowed our heads and prayed and Travis got saved and out back. She said, the moment that happened, she said, we got so excited. Yes, yeah, right, huh? There they are. She said, they stood up in the little bar and out back all their hands on each other. They began to jump up and down and pray. And everybody in the bar began to look at them like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> My question is simple, friend. Who is your Travis? Who is your Wade? Who is your Peter? Who is your Liz? It's time for an uprising. It's time for us to take our faith seriously and be ashamed, not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take out your... If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world.